So Danny, uh, I want to talk to you about your career, your life. Uh, I remember when I first saw you in a movie, I thought, that dude doesn't look like the other folks. Okay? <laughs> that guy looks like he has a story. Literally, like, you know, because all the other guys look like pretty boys, etc. Nine out of ten times, etc. And you just stand out. And I remember watching thinking, I bet there's an interesting backstory. And it turns out there is. <laughs> so tell me how you grew up. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I've always kind of stood out, you know, like when the cops would roll up and there would be like 15 or 16 of us, they'd always go, you, come here. You know, so, <laughs> so, uh, so you, you were grew right. up here in L.A., right? Yeah, right in Los Angeles, yeah. yeah uh, what part, up, East L.A.? Uh, East L.A., Echo Park, and then I moved out to Pacoima when I was about 13 after I got uh, an out-of-state release to Texas for, I think, three years. I stayed about three months, and then my mom and dad bought a house in Pacoima, and I, I moved there. And uh, so, uh, did you? Uh, it, I'm going to ask you a question that I know the answer to. But did you get in trouble with the law? Is that what happened? Yeah, 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 a lot. Uh, so what, what lot. happened? How'd you how'd you get started in in that? Uh, I had an uncle, you know, that was a, kind of a drug addict, armed robber, and I guess he was my mentor. So, you know, if he'd have been an athlete, I might have turned out different. You know, but but uh, so I just kind of like grew up with him. He was only. Uh, I was eight, he was 14, so he was my dad's youngest brother, you know, my Uncle Gilbert, so we kind of uh, really palled around together. Oh, that's interesting. So he's only six years older than you, so it's not like he's a grown man. No, 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 and, no, no, no. and so he's t teaching you all the stuff that he knows, because he's a young kid doing uh, the wrong things, he started, et cetera. He started smoking weed when he was about 14. That made me eight. So he just, you know, when you get started getting loaded on weed, you turn things on. You know, everybody turns on their cat or their puppy or the dog, and I just happened to be there. So did you start smoking weed at eight? Yeah, he turned me on to grass when I was about eight, gave me a fix of heroin when I was about 12. Wow, really? Uh-huh. You know what's so funny is like you like are amazed, but when I talk uh, at a high school and I say my uncle turned me on to grass when I was eight and I took my first fix when I was 12, the high school kids kind of go, uh-huh because it's really a lot more common than people think. You know, older siblings or older, you're turning on their younger brothers or sisters. So. Yeah, no, I, look, I grew up as a massive dork in the suburbs. <laughs> okay, so like, uh, our main thing was, I remember, boy, uh, you know, one of my friends turned me on to ping pong at 12. <laughs> and so that was like, whoa, okay, let's take it easy here, okay? <laughs> Ping pong. <laughs> Ping pong. Like, you got it. All. You got it. We'll play later. <laughs> so, uh, when's the first time that you handled a gun? Oh, uh, when I was about 12, 13, I used to play with my uncle's pistol. And then when he was about, I was about 14 when he said I needed a career. So he gave me a pistol and told me to rob him. So I was, you know, give me your money. And he called me a bitch. He says, I wouldn't give you shit. And then, uh, stood me in front of a mirror and I just practiced. Wow, robbing. and w w when you first did it? Uh, they gave me a sawed off shotgun, it made it a lot easier. I didn't have to say anything. You just pull out the sawed off <laughs> shotgun and they just give you the money. I thought I was really tough, a lady fainted and just like, it, I thought it was me. You know, so basically the shotgun, you know, yeah. so it was. How did that feel? Did it, was it a rush? Were you nervous? Were think, you scared? I think, uh, I think when you're doing drugs, and and crime, especially robberies, you're, you're not sure whether you're doing the robberies to support your drug habits or the drugs to support your robbery habits, because mm. they become a, a habit, a rush, you know. And it's like a, it's it's like a, a, I don't think I've ever committed a crime that wasn't some way drug related. So when I talk at a high school, I just talk about taking drugs and alcohol out of your life, your life is gonna get better. Mm -hmm. And the kids, 14, 15, 16 years old, that are having problems with their school, problems with their parents, you know, uh, uh, the minute they take the drugs and alcohol out, the problem with the parents get better, the problem with the schools get better. That's an amazing story. Now, I know you were in San Quentin. What did you uh, get busted for first? Oh the, f oh, the first time was assault, different assaults and stuff. And the second, the, when I went to the joint, I sold, a, I sold four ounces of pure sugar to a federal agent. 
Uh -huh. uh, it's called the Bunko Sales, and God, they were pissed. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> were they pissed because it wasn't the real deal? Well, no, or? they were pissed because I I didn't give them back. I hid the money. I I buried the money in, in my mom's backyard. I buried a, I think I buried uh, eight thousand dollars, some pistols, and a hand grenade, and I I uh, I buried them in my mom's backyard. So then I went to the joint because I knew I was going to the joint anyway. So, uh -huh. I, I so they wanted their money back. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so so did, did you ever get that money? Did they ever get the money back or no? Is uh, it still in the backyard? No, no. My <laughs> mom was, wrote me and said she was going to put in a sprinkler. She said, be careful. <laughs> Don't dig too did deep. You, keep it real with me. Did you ever spend that money? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. when I came out, I had a little nest egg. Oh, all so. right. Did you ever throw the hand grenade? No, I got rid of it. Okay, yeah. thank God. Right. <laughs> I was a little worried there for a second. Yeah. All right, so you went to jail, et cetera. How in the world do you get into acting? How do you straighten out? What, which happened first? Uh, when I came, when I when I left the penitentiary in 1969, I uh, I devoted my life to just helping others. I just didn't know what else to do. I mean, I knew that I was either gonna, my life was either gonna change, or I was gonna spend the rest of my life locked up. It was just that it's just you get to a point to where this is it. They call it like a crossroads. This is it. I'm either gonna stay clean or sober, or I'm gonna spend the rest of my life in jail and. And I, uh, so I was doing a 12-step program. I, I, uh, I dedicated my life to helping other people. Came out of the joint, and that's all I did. All I did was just like, just try to help anywhere, anywhere I could. I didn't give you one to move, I'd help you. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, just, I just, a, a, you know, a, a Freddie Do-Good or something. And, and uh, slowly, my, I remember the first time I tried to help, help somebody, I was a. Uh, I was, I was in my mom's front yard, and I was watching this lady pull out her trash cans. This is 19, see, this is before they had the big rolling kind. This, yeah, yeah. You used to put everything in a tub and I drag it out. <laughs> <clears throat> and so she, she was trying to drag out this trash can. And I remember walking up to her to, to uh, help her. And I remember her, her saying, no me robas, then. And was like, she got scared. Yeah. And, and I wanted to like just die, because I, Bitch, I'm coming up here to help you, you know, but... but if you told her that, that probably wouldn't have helped. <laughs> but, but, uh, so I just grabbed her trash can, I pulled it out, and she just watched me. So I started, like, pulling all, like, the older people's trash cans out on, before trash day, you know, the night before I'd pull them out. Uh -huh. And the first gift I can remember getting, because, you know, you don't get a lot of gifts in jail. I, some guys do, but I, I did. <laughs> and maybe and, not the kind you want. <laughs> yeah. And so, so uh, the first gift I got was a uh, a double-breasted suede blazer. And I remember my mom said, "Look, me that that old man with the arthritis brought you that." Oh, that's great. And you know what I mean? I, but it was just stuck in my mind. That suede blazer was pretty sharp in '69 and '70. But, uh, but, uh, but. Uh, so, and that's how I just continued. I continued so to that, work at school. So that's fascinating. And I'm curious as to, like, that whole idea of I'm just going to blindly help people and see where it leads me. So where did it lead you? Did it lead you to great stuff? Or did it take a long time? How did it go down then? I think one of the reasons that I'm in the film business is, like, me and a kid named Danny Levitoff started a gardening business, and it just took off, and we would, like, like, there's a couple of people in our neighborhood that were old and sick, and we would just do their yards for free. And it always seems that, that something good came of it. You know, we got gardening equipment, and then because uh, when we started, we didn't even have a, a lawnmower. We would knock on people's doors and say, "You want some more lawn? We'll mow." Sure. Okay, you got a lawnmower. And then if they had a lawnmower, we'd use it and go mow. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you asked them, but, but no, nobody you know what? But that's how you start a business. No, it's true. That's and, rolling uh, up your sleeve. Everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. That, that's a great I got, story. I got into the movie business. 11.30 at night, 1985. This kid that I was working with called me up and said, there's a lot of blow down here at my job, man. Please come down and hang out with me. And I was working with him, so I, I kind of went down to hang out with him. So you, are you a sponsor? I was a sponsor, yeah, yeah, yeah I was a sponsor. Something like that. Uh -huh. So I walked, I, I drove down to help him, just, just to hang out with him. And I thought he, he worked in the warehouse district. It was a warehouse down, on Dogs, down in Dogtown by Alvera Street. So I thought he worked in a warehouse when I, I thought I was going to go there, sit in the parking lot, smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, 
then he was going to go back in and everybody would think we're gay. And uh, it wasn't, we <laughs> I mean, were sitting like two, we got two old guys sitting in a parking lot. You know? and, and so it was like, like I walked all these generators and I walked onto the movie set of a movie called Runaway Train. Yeah, and John I Voight and Eric Roberts. I stood there, I'm watching the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. All these guys were like acting like, like convicts and hey, motherfucker, hey. And I'm thinking, wow. And, and they'd come up to me and go, hey, does this look tough? I go, yeah, you'd be somebody's wife in prison. That's really true. <laughs> and I kept smearing all their tattoos. They all had tattoos. They go, oh, shit, I'm sorry. And they all smeared. And, and, uh, <laughs> and this guy asked me, uh, do you want to be in this movie? And I said, well, what do I have to do? He said, do you want to be an extra? And I said, an extra what? <laughs> extra what? I says, love that. He says, can you act like a convict? <laughs> I said, I'll give it a shot. Now, it could have been in every penitentiary in the state of California. So I said, I'll try it. And, uh, so I took off my shirt. I had that big tattoo on my chest. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'll never forget that guy goes like this. He goes, wait. He goes. I'm thinking, what stupid gang is that? You know I mean? <laughs> so I, if that was my neighborhood, I wouldn't would blame me. And so he said, leave your shirt off. And I left my shirt off. And this other guy comes over and says, hey, you're Danny Trejo. And I go, yeah. He says, I saw you win the lightweight and the welterweight title up in San Quentin. I go, you're Eddie Bunker. And I knew this guy. And we started uh -huh. talking. I said, what are you doing here, Eddie? He says, I, I, I wrote the screenplay. I didn't know what that said. He said, I, he said, I adapted this to a screenplay. I didn't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, yeah. he says, oh, good for he you. Says, what are you doing here? I says, I was hanging with this kid. You know, I was hanging. This kid wants to stay clean. And he said, I heard that you had been working this program, that you got this program. He thought, he thought the 12-step program was mine. Everybody did. You know, that, oh, that really? I started, yeah, that this, and, and, uh, <laughs> That's really and funny. They, uh, and so he said, hey, you know what? We need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. Are you still boxing? And I said, I, I train. What's it pay? And he said, 320 a day. And I said, how bad do you want this guy beat up? You know, I thought, <laughs> 320 bucks, they, that's a hit to me. You know, you want yeah. to, you know, no, you be careful, this actor's high strung, he might sock you. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think you're gonna be all right. I said for <laughs> 320 bucks, give him a stick. You know, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I started training Eric Roberts how to box for the movie Runaway Train. Oh, Andre cool. Kajalowski, the director, saw me, liked the way I looked, uh, liked the contrast between me and Eric, and uh, he wanted me to play in the movie. He was, you do movie in, in uh, it's Russian, right? Russian aristocrat. Uh -huh. You be in movie. And everybody was, no, no, he can't, he can't. It and turns out you could. Andre was trying to explain to them why, because the, the, the guy they had cast to fight Eric was kind of like an Antonio Banderas looking uh -huh. guy. And then Eric Robert is kind of like a Julia Roberts looking yeah, guy. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, you went I mean, there. I mean, I mean, and, and they're like, they look alike, you know what I mean? Right. And so, so I remember Andre goes, like, well, Andre goes, look. And he goes to Eric, he goes, oh. And then he goes to this guy, he goes, oh. And then he goes to me, he goes, ah. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, is he making fun of me? Because <laughs> you can get in that boxing right away. <laughs> but I, uh, but so he, they said, make him sag. And so all of a sudden, I was just Taft Hartley. And so all of a sudden, you're a union and you're good. Everything changed from hey you to Mr. Trejo. Yeah. So that's amazing. So did, was the, did the next role come right away? Or, or did it take a while? Was it somebody who'd seen you in that it was, movie? It was the stunt coordinator was teaching me how to, how to fight. Okay, uh -huh. well, I've been fighting all my life. But what I've learned, like through 12-step programs and through being out on the streets and to working with citizens and to get in prison behind you, I found out, well, you listen to people. And, you, you know, and if they're in charge, you listen to them. You know? So I was listening to the stunt coordinator, and he was showing me the difference between a real punch and a, and a, and a movie punch. There's a big difference. Sure, you know? so, right. That makes sense. And I listened, and I would do the same thing to Eric. So the stunt coordinator offered me a job. He said, hey, I'm, I have another job. As soon as this is done, would you like to 
Right. See, that's funny. We were just talking on the show about how it's the whole world is who you know, right? And if you get into a certain business, you wind up knowing someone, yeah. then you get another job, and from there. You, you know, it's like it's who you know, you got to be able to do it, and then you got to be able to, pleasant to work with. You mean you're not making any waves? I see people get on, on movie sets that, that think they're entitled and I'm supposed to be here, and then you don't see them anymore. Uh -huh. You know, and it's like, I got there, I was blessed. I'm, I knew it from the minute, 320 a day, are you kidding? I wasn't making that a week. You yeah. know? In fact, I remember, the, I worked for almost three weeks, and I, I added up 320, 320, 320, 320. I added up, oh, it's a good check. Then when they gave me a check, I didn't know about turnarounds and force calls and uh, meal pay. I didn't know. I looked, I thought they made a mistake. I said, shit. <laughs> I was gone. I was going to cash that before anybody I, I, found that. That same thing happened to me. I worked as an extra too, for, very briefly. Now nah, nobody came up to me and said that's the guy, right? But but like they they pay you a yeah. lot when you're union if you go over a certain amount yeah. of time and stuff. I was like, I think they, same exact thing. I'm like, I think they made a mistake, man. I got to get out of here. You know, the 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 craft service used to be a big table with all this. Lunch meat, and this is like 65. This is before. I mean, I mean 85. This is like crap. So I'm, I used to make these sandwiches for me and my son. I'd make about four or five sandwiches, and then I'd get candy. And I'd, I was, I was uh, basically stealing. But but I'd, I'd, and so this girl comes up, right? I got about four sandwiches. The dog was stacked like this, and uh, and she goes, uh, "Daddy, you have a meal penalty." I was, no, no, this isn't all for me. I, I'm making some some of the guys. I thought. <laughs> I thought they were they were like busting me right. And she goes, no, 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 we didn't pay, we didn't feed you in six hours, so we you got to give you some more. I said, oh, she said, who's that for? I said, well, me and my son. Oh, here. So she gave me that in a case of coke. <laughs> yeah, and the movie business is an unbelievable business, yeah. man. I remember one day somebody visited us back in the old radio studio, and they're like, so where's Craft Services? I was like, what do you mean? There's a McDonald's down the street. I mean, what do you mean, Craft Services? So. Uh, D Danny, w just one more thing on the acting. W was there a moment where there was a big breakthrough where all of a sudden you're a star? Was it Heat? Was it before that? Well, uh, first of all, I don't consider myself a star. I'm a working actor, and that's like just, I'm blessed. You know, the whole world can think you're a movie star, but you can't. You know? <laughs> no, I, I hear you on that, and, but you but know, I you know believe, people know you now. I honestly believe that. Uh, Desperado. When I did Desperado, when Rodriguez gave me Desperado, I honestly believe that whoop, we jumped, mm -hmm. and then when you know, Con Air, bang, and then heat, boom, you know, and so, and so, you know, the, the the more you get recognized, the the you know the, the bigger the roles get, you know, and and now it's like Machete kills. I'm 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 starring in a film. I can I I'm even embarrassed to say I'm the lead because this is Mel Gibson. There's Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen is like the most. Even though everybody thinks he's a great actor, I still think he's one of the most underrated actors there. He's unbelievable. He does this scene in Machete where he plays the president, and. Uh, and he yells at Machete. He asks Machete to do something, and Machete says, no, get yourself another man. And he jumps up and says, I'm the goddamn president of the United States. And when he does it, he's so convincing, you can almost see them big ships going, do, 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 do. I blew the first scene. I said, wow. <laughs> and, and so you're like, OK, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, he's amazing. Well, yeah. I got to keep it real. Who's crazier, Mel Gibson or Charlie Sheen? Uh, Get, if you stand between both of them, you get electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> they got Wait, so and, much. And didn't they got so much energy pumping through them? It's unbelievable. Didn't Charlie Sheen have a machete on the roof once? Yes. Yeah, he yes. did, right? So yeah, that's what makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now, his dad was the president on uh, on West Wing. Yeah, that's right. So that's yeah. He's, yeah, but he's great. And so and, and machete. Uh, I watched the first yeah. one, and you know, as over the top as it is with the violence and everything. You know, I do politics yeah. and I cover it all the time, right? People actually say those lines. The politicians Absolutely. that are anti-immigrant actually say those I things. Say it. I was like, funny as like when I was watching it, and then uh, just just a while back there was a a shooting where everybody was at rage because somebody, one of the guards, got killed on the on the on the border. And God, man, it was just like you know, let's make the fence higher, let's make it bigger, and then to find out it was you know, friendly fire. You know, so, but that's the guns, that's the guns. It's like, you know, you can't blame anybody, man. And, and, and it's like, you know, if you have a gun, someone's gonna get killed, 
you know, now on the on the border, they've got big guns. Yeah, and, and and the more people get themselves wound up, like, oh, I'm going to get them, I'm going to get them, and what do they do? They wind up get, shooting shoot one of their arms. Yeah. So uh, I take it that Machete Kills is a little bit uh, even further over oh the my top. My God. Uh, do you wind up killing people in that movie? Charlie Sheen, <laughs> Lady Gaga, Mel Gibson, uh, Vanessa Hutchins, Sophia Varaga. Uh, Damn. They, uh, Amber Heard. <laughs> God, uh, oh, I heard Michelle you had, Rodriguez, uh, I, I Jessica heard you, Alba. Uh, Jessica Alba too? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, oh, I, you, I have a love scene with Amber Heard. Where I, started, I was just about to say, I heard you had a love scene with one of them. Okay. We're like, it's funny because uh, Robert said, I'm ready to do this scene with Amber. And uh, Robert said, okay, action, action. Amber, why are you laughing? Because Danny won't stop saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jesus. That's good. But, you know, you could, uh, if I was you, I would have been like, well, I mean, Machetti's a ladies' man. There's some chance that he should have a couple of more oh, loves. I mean, you got Sophia there. You got Jessica there. Everybody wants to kill him. You know, it's, like, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's just a, it's kind of a, just a roller coaster ride of emotion and adrenaline. You know, if you're looking for, like, literary value, <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's just a fun movie. Man. Yeah, no, no. First one was fun. I am looking forward to the second one. Awesome. Danny, thanks so much Thank for coming you. in, man. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Great conversation.